and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. I am Daryl Grove and I'm joined by a man who is the world's biggest cricket fan. It's Taylor Rockwell. Hello. Hello. I am when other sports are played on it. (laughs) Does that count? It does. In this case, it does. Because we are here to talk about the US men's national team World Cup qualifier against St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which is Friday 3.30 Eastern Mm -hmm. on B in Sports. Everyone's favorite time and channel for (laughs) easily accessible soccer. Before we get into why that is, Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we should set up what this game is all about. Because I always forget, like, we're so tunnel vision on the U.S. men's national team. We forget that some people just dip in and out Mm -hmm. and don't know where we are in the various stages of World Cup qualification. Right. So where are we, Taylor? We are in the not final round of World Cup qualifying. Mm -hmm. So the final round is the hex, the hexagonal, which is basically the top two teams from all these different groups get filed into that and then yeah. they all play each other those are the away. six remaining and then you battle it out for the three and a half world cup spots available we're not quite there yet we've got to get into that this is true we are near there we have two games left in this stage which is essentially where like the next tier of teams are all <laughs> competing uh so in our group we've got the united states trinidad and Tobago, guatemala and saint vincent and the grenadines so the setup is we play saint vincent and the grenadines on friday then we play trinidad and tobago on Tuesday. Correct. Win both of those games, we definitely make the hex. If we win the game on Friday mm-hmm. and Trinidad beats Guatemala in the other game, we are through. We are through. So we are going to be either in the hex or not by mm-hmm. Tuesday latest. And, then and the, if we're not in the hex, then um, the sky is falling. This is Everybody very true. look out. And then the only thing with that is that it doesn't really matter if you come in first or second. It's not like you're ranked. You play weaker opposition. The only difference would be when you play the teams that you play. Yeah, it so affects your schedule in the hex, right? So I'm pretty sure if the United States finishes top the way the schedule would work is they play mexico first that's yep. the first group game they would play but if they finish second they play mexico like, like back to back twice in, middle, in right? five days yeah, yeah basically and i feel like either way that's good there's excitement either and way. i feel like either way that's bad so <laughs> <laughs> agree to disagree one way or another you've uh-huh. got to face chicharito one way or another not necessarily he's <laughs> got a broken foot or broken wrist or whatever so maybe we get him sooner and then he can't play <laughs> in a year Later in today's show, we're also going to preview England's start to World Cup qualifying. Mm-hmm. They go away to Slovakia on Sunday. Sam Allardyce's first England game, that'll be in the second half of the show. Mm-hmm. All right, up first then, let's get into this St. Vincent game. Um, the big question I've had on Twitter is, why is it a 3.30 <laughs> Eastern kickoff and why is it on B in sports? Sure. So I can answer both of those more yeah, or less. Yeah, please do. The reason why it's at 3.30, despite being Eastern Standard Time, is because... The yeah, because St. Vincent in the same time uh-huh. zone as the U.S., yeah? Because the field in which this game is being played, it's a cricket stadium. Uh, it's their national stadium, I believe. does not have floodlights. A cricket pitch, there if you, you will. Uh, excuse me. Mm, England. Mm. <laughs> uh, bowling and whatnot. Wickets. Pads. White. Uniforms? Question mark. For, te- um, for yeah. test matches only. Anyway, the stadium does not have floodlights, so it cannot be played at night. Cannot be played even at dusk, as we have found out many times when we think we could do one more game uh-huh. in, in the twilight. <laughs> that doesn't quite work. Um, and then why it's on being sport? It's because basically, I believe the way it works is that each individual federation can deal with the TV rights as they so choose. Home team sells the TV rights. Right. So it's St. Vincent Federation's choice to sell, um, mm. I think, through a third party to be in sports. So please, nobody tweet at US Soccer to complain about the game right. being on being sports. They have no say in this. I would also say, really, I know it's not the like most readily accessible channel, and I know it's going to be kind of a pain, especially with the time zone. But you also can't really be mad at St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This is probably the biggest opponent they're ever going to get to play at home, at least for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I mean, not in the history of ever, but yeah, yeah recently. But in terms of, I mean, like, I don't think Spain is going to St. Vincent, so <laughs> we'll see. But And so I think it, it it's kind of makes sense for them to try to make as much money as they can, try to get the best offer that they can. Yeah. And they probably don't really care who wins that bidding war as long as they get paid <laughs> at the end of the day. That's right. So let's talk about the actual game. Mm-hmm. Um, the big, um, the, all the stories I've seen, and I know you've seen the same ones, mm-hmm. basically say, um, don't take this team too lightly, lightly but we're going to beat this team easily. Well, it's, it's more, there's that one, which is not so bad. I think my favorite one is don't take this team too lightly because, you know, crazy things can happen. Now, we're not going to tell you anything about the team or how they play or any of their players <laughs> or even their manager's name, but it's going to be hot, and that could be tough, and it's a cricket pitch. Disregarding that the first time this game was played in the United States, in St. Louis, when the United States won 6-1, to one, played on a baseball field. Yes. A very clearly visible baseball field. Yeah, no, please, no one get high and mighty about this being on a cricket <laughs> Yeah, right? Because <laughs> yeah. I was sort of ready to be high and mighty, just uh-huh. a little bit. 
And then I was like, all right, never mind. Never mind. All right. <laughs> well, let's get, let's get into how this affects the game. Okay. Sure. First of all, if you've never seen a cricket pitch, the way it works is mm-hmm. it's a big circle. Right. So it's going to be a big, wide, open field. Obviously, they've drawn a soccer field in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. There's a cricket uh, wicket, which yep. is a long stretch of like hard ground. You're pretty much going to be looking at the field, and dead center, you're going to see a long stretch of hard ground, mm-hmm. which I think is going to be a problem for midfielders. Yep, I would say so. What isn't going to be a problem so much is uh, the intense atmosphere, shall we say, because the fans seem to be situated fairly far away from the pitch. Because of the circular Right, and even like the most, I think there's the party deck is what (laughs) I've seen them promoted as on the uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines official Facebook page. Yeah. That's even pretty far away. It's kind of near the corner. It's where they tend to run when they celebrate. But even like I watched watched the the highlights, the extended highlights of Trinidad and Tobago's 3-2 win at that stadium. And when Trinidad go ahead, you see all the away fans celebrating and there are many of them packed in there. And you see the St. Vincent fans around them also celebrating. So it seems like maybe they're kind of there to be excited to kind hey, of enjoy the atmosphere to enjoy paid, the event. They paid for the party deck. Yeah, I think $20 <laughs> gets you into the upper deck. $40 gets you into the party deck. Well, I'll be at the party deck here in Total Soccer Studio <laughs> watching on v and Sports. Right. So I think it's not like going to be the – like you don't have that claustrophobic yeah. atmosphere and you're it's not, not going to It's not welcome have, to hell. No, and it's right. not 50,000 people booing. But it will be mm-hmm. on this field, which is maybe not ideal because yep. there's this cricket wicket in the middle. It will be at 3.30 in the afternoon because of the lack of flood. That's I mean, you deal. have to play in daylight. Mm-hmm. It's going to be hot. Yep. Um, okay, so if you're the U.S., before we start picking our team, sure. if you're the U.S. going down there, what should the approach be? How do you combat sort of a possibly bumpy field and the intense heat of the afternoon? I think w- if you look at it, like, I think we took a moment to reevaluate this, to look at it from, as being coaches' perspective, mm-hmm. what we would do. And I think the answer is, if you know that you are playing against inferior opposition on a bad pitch in extreme heat, you are going to try to possess the ball. You're going to try to possess the ball in not particularly risky spaces. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to move it back and forth across the back four and into the midfield, just in case it's an errant pass or it bounces in a weird way, and then the other team is off. Right. So, and I think then you kind of try to get into the advantageous position early. So you put that pressure on early, you get that goal, then you can kind of possess and maybe sit back a little bit. When you do possess, you move it into their half, and that's where you're comfortable in possession. This is what slightly worries me, Hmm. is the thing that Jürgen Klinsmann seemed Mm -hmm. really excited about at Copa America Centenario. Mm -hmm. And bear in mind, he selected more or less as many players as he can from the Copa America Centenario roster. Mm -hmm. Is that the U.S. seemed to come up with this strategy of being in your face, running people over, being all aggressive, right? right? I mean, this is why we got so many yellow cards. It's why Bobby Wood was suspended for the semi-final against Argentina. It's how Jermaine Jones got sent off, and I think Alejandro Bedoya got himself booked. Mm-hmm. All that kind of stuff, right? I'm worried that he's going to be amping the guys up to be sort of, let's keep being aggressive, let's keep knocking people over. And we go down, and in the heat in the middle of the afternoon, against an opponent that we're technically superior to, mm-hmm. we try and make it about attitude and physicality when we would be smarter to possess and go slow. Well, welcome to the frustrating reign of Klinsman. Yeah. Because on the one hand, you could make the argument that, yes, but that's in the Copa America Centenario that's against very strong opposition when you absolutely have to go out there and get a win. Yeah. And playing pretty soccer maybe isn't an option available to you. Right, because when you're, when you're the inferior opposition, mm-hmm. then you need to get in their face, right? right? Right, So then you could say, like, but he knows against St. Vincent, they put six past them at home. Playing away, it's going to be tougher for sure but you still really don't need to take that approach. But then he does the press conferences, which are all about intensity and how mm-hmm. we can't take our foot off the pedal and how this is you know, do or die, make or break games. We've got to give everything, leave everything on the field. And I feel like that's going to be his approach to this game is not necessarily knock him over, hit him, run him down, get cards, but sort of don't hold anything back and don't be surprised if the United States puts six more past St. Vincent for that reason. Okay. Mm-hmm. So shall we get to picking our, um, our preferred lineup and maybe even the lineup we think Klinsman will pick? We shall. But before, I just want to say this real fast, but yeah. before we get accused of overlooking CONCACAF opponents, okay, and yeah. before we get CONCACAF, let me just make this point. So the game that people tend to point to with this one as a warning sign is like Antigua and Barbuda, I think it was, in 2013 maybe. Yeah. When they went away, they were like 145th in the world, and Eddie Johnson, I think, had to score like a 90th minute header. Right. And so there's this idea that like, see, it could be the same thing. We don't know what's going to happen. We need the result. So that was 145th. Uh, St. Vincent is 175th. In the five times that the United States has played a team ranked below 150, they have won every single game by a combined score of 27 to 3. And one of the lowest scoring ones is Puerto Rico recently. 
that we watched that game, it was three to one. Yeah. So again, this is why we're sort of taking this approach of yes, it's Concacaf, yes, it's hot, yes, it's a bad pitch. Still, no reason for them not to go in there expecting to win and playing to win. Okay, so before we talk about you, yeah. then um, who are the St. Vincent players that we should at least be aware of? Like one name that comes to comes to mind is. Um, Alex Anderson, mm-hmm. who I believe scored the first goal in St. Louis when the U.S. played St. Vincent. Sure that six one, the one came first. It was St. Mm-hmm. Vincent that struck first. He's also when St. Vincent played Trinidad at home, lost three to two, but looked to be very much in that game. He was the one who set up both goals. He played right. in the through ball that led to the penalty that led to the goal. He then did the FIFA assist where he. Drew the keeper out, squared it, <laughs> goal there. And he, I believe, plays for Seattle Sanders 2 or maybe even the first team? I think it's the first team. It used to be Seattle Sanders 2 when last they played. I believe okay. he's been promoted to the he's first team. He's made the team. step up. He has. Oh, so this guy's a pro. He is. Where will we see him for St. Vincent? Probably in the central midfield, being that playmaker, probably tending to stay more forward than he should. <laughs> uh, and I think that's going to be, again, the story of this game, is St. Vincent trying very hard. But you'll start to see those cracks show as the game wears on, where you don't have that level of professionalism, where you will see them stretched out, Mm -hmm. where maybe two of the back four will step out and two of them won't. Maybe they won't be so sharp on set pieces. We've seen a lot of like almost own goals from them in different rounds of qualifying. Actual own goals, I've seen. And also actual own goals as well. (laughs) The other really curious thing that I have to point out here. So when they first played the U.S., okay, that first game, to this squad, only seven of those players have transferred over. So there's only seven players that have this played. This November 2015. Yes. So seven of the 18 that, that were on that roster in that 18 are now involved. And those aren't even the players that played. Those are just the seven that made that 18-player uh, roster. Only 10 were in the 3-2 to two loss squad to Trinidad. And of those two combined, only four players have played in both games. So they only have four players that have really been there throughout. Yeah. Those players would be Oleks Anderson, Tevin Slater, Kevin Francis, and the captain, Roy Richards. So Roy Richards. four players who've kind of really been in there. I think keep an eye on Roy Richards being the captain, trying to do some defensive organization. We did see him point at someone when they almost scored an I own goal. I saw him kind of laughing at someone who basically yeah. scored an own goal against Trinidad, right? Yes. So I'd say <laughs> keep an eye on Oleks Anderson. He's going to be the playmaker. Keep an eye on Tevin Slater, who has scored many goals for this team. That said, final point, they have not won a game since they beat Antigua and Barbuda, the aforementioned Antigua and Barbuda, 2-1, to one, November 4th, 2015. Okay. So it's almost a year, and in that time, they have also not gotten a draw either. So they have only lost since November of 2015. Okay, so U.S. heavily favored in this game, expected to win. What is the best U.S. 11 to face this team? Okay. And before you name your 11, it's mm-hmm. worth reminding people that, one, Clint Dempsey not on this roster, has an irregular heartbeat, is getting that checked out. Two, Jesse Zardes has a broken foot, not on this roster, might not be playing soccer for a little while. Mm -hmm. Michael Bradley, suspended because of yellow card accumulation. Um, Michael Orozco Fiscal, suspended because of the red card he got in the Copa America. Jermaine Jones, on the roster, but um, hasn't played since, I think, early July for Colorado. Winslow McDowell, also not on the roster due to injury. Not on the U.S. roster? Oh, you're not familiar with him? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> not on the St. Vincent roster. I he see. was the starting goalkeeper against the USA. Won't be in this game either. He made some good saves in that. He sure that did. That 6-1 win could have been bigger if not for Winslow McDowell. Sure could have. So we won't be facing so For him. all these reasons, we're looking at a U.S. team that should be confident, and we're looking at a U.S. team that, with those uh, absences, for whatever reason you mm-hmm. mentioned, one of whom might not be an absentee. We'll talk about him in a second. Well, let's, let's start at the front. Okay? okay, so the big story is the absence of Clint Dempsey mm-hmm. and, in many ways, the absence of Jesse Zardes because mm-hmm. he's a guy that Klinsman, uh, for better or worse, basically always selects either as a starting right. striker or as a winger, right? So no Dempsey, no Zardes. But we finally have the opportunity to play Bobby Wood and Josie Altador up top together in a partnership. <laughs> well, to be fair, I've been saying that all week. So have I. Until we went back and watched the highlights <laughs> yep. of USA versus St. Vincent, <laughs> November 2015, starting up top, Josie Altador and Bobby Wood. In a 4-4-2 without Clint Dempsey. Clint Dempsey dropped. That was mm-hmm. when Klinsman dropped Clint Dempsey yep. and said, we're going to look at other options. And now, you've got to give Klinsman credit where it's due, right? Now, with Dempsey's irregular heartbeat mm-hmm. and he's held out, that kind of comes good because it's, it's a thing he's planted back in November and it now possibly bears fruit in this Altador Wood partnership um, against St. Vincent and maybe against Trinidad. Maybe he knew then. Maybe he knew then. Did well, the at least he's planning for the future, right? So are we both on board with an Altador Bobby Wood two-man strike force? I think so. I think so because Altador is in form for Toronto. Bobby Wood has gotten off to a good start uh, in the Bundesliga. Obviously, only one game, but looked mm-hmm. good in preseason. 
earned that move to the Bundesliga, so I think he edges out Jordan Morris, who is also having a good career. But it's nice to have three different striker options, all of whom are in form and not there based on, yeah, but it's Josie out or he gets called in. Or, yeah, it's Jordan Morris, he gets called in. And I like thinking of this as a partnership. Mm-hmm. I like to think of it as Bobby Wood will stay high. Bobby Wood will stretch the mm-hmm. St. Vincent defence. Bobby Wood will be aggressive and looking for balls over the top. Mm-hmm. That frees up Josie Altador to maybe do more like a Clint Dempsey kind of thing, where he can come back and collect mm-hmm. the ball and connect play. So essentially, Josie is the new deuce. Yeah, at least in the, in this partnership. And when you saw those highlights we, when we went and watched St. Vincent versus US from November, you saw Altidore coming a little deeper, connecting play a little bit more. And I think he's more comfortable doing that than being the guy who has to stay up top. I think so. I think he's comfortable doing it when he knows that other players are going to be doing it as well. Mm-hmm. And we saw lots of different combinations between Altador Wood and Fabian Johnson, who started yes. at left midfield in that 6-1 to victory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't expect to see that again, unfortunately. No, I don't. But I think when he's playing with another player who he can kind of play off of and knows is going to be creative, I saw a lot of people make the point that like when he was in his prime for the U.S. national team, it was when he was playing with Charlie Davies. He right. was fast and quick, and they had good interplay. And I've heard Bobby Wood, I can't remember who said this, someone referred to Bobby Wood as the rich man's Charlie Davies. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of fair, I think. Yeah. It's harsh to Charlie Davis, but it's kind of fair because Bobby Wood has the same aggression, mm-hmm. maybe not quite the same pace, but really close. Yep. And I think is a little bit of a smarter soccer player in terms of the clever runs that he yeah, makes. I think so. And I think that's and, where we both, that's why we both want to see that front two and yeah. not Bobby Wood out on the wing. And it's not just sort of get Bobby Wood in there and that's all we want because we watched him uh, play for Hamburger this past week in the first Bundesliga yeah, game. I think he start. looks. So confident playing as that lone striker, staying in the middle of the pitch. He, you could just see how aware he was of what his responsibilities were, where he needed to be, when he needed to make runs, when he didn't need to make runs. And I think that's because he's used to playing as a striker. Mm-hmm. If you play him on the wing, he's capable. He's a smart footballer, as you said, but he might not be as inclined to do that. He might not be as comfortable, and I think his performance will suffer. And we're assuming 4 4 for the U.S., right? Because that's what Klinsman seemed mm-hmm. to be really happy about towards the end of the Copa America. Yep. And because this works for Wood and Altidore as a partnership. Mm-hmm. But there's always a chance that we see this, this lineup roll out and it's Altidore as a central striker and Bobby Wood out on the wing. And that's when I start sort of biting my fist. Oh, yeah. There's, I mean, there's lots of different possible iterations in here. And that's almost where I feel like it makes sense to go with, here's what I think he'll do for whatever reason. And here's the lineup that I think Klinsman will pick for whatever reason and not try to go down the rabbit hole. I'm like, well... We could move him here, but then he comes in here, but then that guy goes there, but then you've got to start somebody else. And it just becomes <laughs> way too many iterations. So we're selecting basically a 4-4-2, mm-hmm. right? Okay, so let's move to the wings. Okay. Who do you see starting on the wing? Sure. Uh, I mean, it could go any number of ways, but I think the most likely person is going to be Graham Zussi. Yes. I think he's going to start, and I think that leaves it open for one, like, quote-unquote exciting player in the form of maybe Christian Pulisic, maybe Darlington Nagby. We're not allowed to have both. No. <laughs> that would be far too exciting. Yeah, we'd, we'd break things. I think, honestly, the most exciting choice would be to say to see Darlington Nagby on the right wing and Christian Pulisic on the left wing. Mm-hmm. That would get everybody excited. It'd be, like, Nagby's sort of um, clever, sensible possession, mm-hmm. his ability to sort of glide forward the, with the ball. Pulisic's, like, pace and attacking intent down the left. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I think... Um, away in a CONCACAF game in a World Cup qualifier, it just screams Graham Zussi to it me. Does. It does. Right? It, it screams, and again, from a pragmatic standpoint, it screams that because you need the result. You want uh-huh. those three points. You don't want to go into Trinidad having to get that win. Yeah, yeah. And even then, maybe needing some help. Uh-huh. So essentially here, you, it makes sense to play those veterans who know what they're doing, who can calm things down, and then get the results, and then maybe you experiment a little bit later it does. on. I mean, I agree with that. Again, if I'm picking this team, it's Pulisic and Nagby oh, out wide. But I'm also, you've got to live in the real world, right, where Graham Zuzzi is definitely going to start ahead Actually, of one of those back. guys. Actually, I take I wouldn't agree with you. Oh, really? Because I, I would probably go, this is like winging it, and I would say maybe it's a 4-2-3-1, even though I would like Altador and Wood to start together. But like maybe it's Altador dropping deep a little bit more, and it's Wood in that lone position, and then maybe it's Fabian Johnson attacking on that left hand side. Yeah, good luck. You have to scratch up some more fullbacks from somewhere. Kellen Acosta, <laughs> Steve Birnbaum, maybe, maybe, yeah, possibly. I mean, yeah, no? I mean one of but, those guys could end yeah, up playing that position. But I don't think that's going to happen. So I think it's going to be Graham Zusi, and then I would lean towards Christian Pulisic because really? that seems to be the player that, in terms of who got minutes in the Centenario, it was Pulisic over Nagy. I see. The other thing that could happen is Bedoya could be posted up out wide, which then would leave us with not so many options in the center, Mm -hmm. right? So let's move to our central midfield. Sure. I think 
in with Michael Bradley's suspension, mm-hmm. Jermaine Jones injured, Caleb Stanko kind of injured and inexperienced. Mm-hmm. There's no way he starts, right? He said, yep. <laughs> tempting fate. Caleb Stanko again came out of his uh, his game this past weekend in the 32nd minute yeah. of the Swiss Super League. For his Le- Liechtenstein team, yes, <laughs> oddly. Exactly. Um, I think Carl Beckerman starts this game. Yep. It's really all about who his partner is. Mm-hmm. Um, on one hand, I think it could be Alejandro Bedoya, mm-hmm. and then that, that frees up Zussi and Pulisic or Zussi and Nagby on the wings. It could be Sasha Kleshton. Because mm-hmm. what is more Jurgen Klinsmann than calling up a guy to replace a centre-back and he's the last guy in the squad and then he starts the game? Well, do you want my honest answer? Because what's more Jurgen Klinsmann than that is starting Jermaine Jones. And that is the thing that I really somehow will be surprised by and won't be surprised yeah. by at the same time. I don't know how that's possible. It's the Jurgen paradox. <laughs> Once again, I'm failing to choose between two things. But that's kind of where Jurgen Klinsmann leaves me. Because... He has proven himself time and time again. Oh, we to love be the him. Player. We've got to love Jermaine yeah, Jones. Yeah, we do. But he has been rehabbing. He has been kind of frustrating Colorado mm-hmm. fans, and I think it will be definitely frustrating for them to see him just come in and work super hard and then maybe come back to Colorado and be like, oh, I'm a little bit injured still. I picked up a, a knock here, so I need two more weeks. That right. would not go very well, but I could see that happening. So don't be surprised if you see that Jermaine Jones in the starting lineup. I mean, I'm not a Colorado fan, mm-hmm. so I'm not saying this from a Colorado perspective, but mm-hmm. just from a, a sensible standpoint, I would hope that Jermaine Jones is on this roster for his personality and if there's an emergency against Trinidad and we desperately mm-hmm. need his power yeah. and drive, if that game does end up being a game that we cannot lose, right. then I can see risking Jermaine Jones. I think if the St. Vincent game goes as planned and we win and maybe there's nothing on the line against Trinidad because they already beat Guatemala, mm. then I think there's no need to risk Jermaine Jones at all. Yeah. Right? Agreed. Then you can send him back to Colorado and say, hey, he practiced with us for a week. He's looking good. He's all yours. Yep. Thanks, thanks, thanks for getting him. Thanks, thanks for getting for him there, guys. Thanks for spending all that money yeah, on him. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, and this is <laughs> not to bring up the question of why do we do this, but like you could give me... Pretty much any outfield player on this national team and tell me a position, and I could be like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, you could say, like, Steve Birnbaum is a defensive midfielder. And I'd be like, yeah, I could see the merits in that. Like, it really, and so with anything you're saying, you're not, you're probably not going to get a, like, no, that's not going to happen for me. <laughs> I would I would say, though, that given the importance of this game, combined with the fact that, what, Kleshin hasn't been called up in, like, two years, um, I think I was at the last time, I think he was, I was, a member of the press corps last time he was caught up for a game, and I asked him if his improved performances were based on shaving his mustache. Didn't get a laugh. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad I got one from you. So I think that's the last time he was this around. Is a sympathy laugh. Yeah, I appreciate that. So I think he strikes me more as a player who gets 30 or 40 minutes in this game after the United States is leading at halftime. But doesn't it make sense to have Cleshton sort of picking passes through that St. Vincent defense? Oh, yeah, it does. And taking set pieces. Mm-hmm. You've got to think with Bradley out and Landon Donovan long retired. You want um, the leading assist maker in Major League Soccer? Yeah, because yep. you've seen him take a free kick. And I'm not talking about shooting from a free kick. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about crossing. You've seen him take corner kicks. Mm-hmm. Um, Sasha Cleshton delivers. Yeah, he absolutely does. I'm, again, you will not get an argument from me about <laughs> why he shouldn't start. <laughs> but I think he, he very well could and should, maybe. But again, it comes down to the formation. And I don't see a fully fit Alejandro Bedoya and a fully fit Kyle Beckerman not starting in this team. So they're the central midfielders. And then we think Zuzi and then either Nagby or Pulisic on, on the wings. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing since you... I we, do think Kleshton gets minutes in this game. Yeah, maybe not the Trinidad game. Yeah. Speaking of set pieces, so we watched the... Again, we watched the St. Vincent mm-hmm. game from November... It was that clever Josie Altador stand behind on a corner kick, stand behind the goalkeeper at the mm-hmm. near post, then sneakily like go behind the goalkeeper in the goal and then pop out at the far post, yep. be open for a header. We've never seen it again since that game, I don't think. I there's a chance maybe the US pulls that trick out of the bag again. I would bet money that they have some sort of play in this game. Yeah. Some sort of either. I'm talking corner about that or... specific one. Yeah, that may well be. Because again, in that Trinidad game, Trinidad scored, and I forget who ends up getting the credit for it for the first goal. It might have been Kenwin Jones. I think it was a different Jones. But it's, a, it's essentially an Olympico. And then a, a St. Vincent player tries to dive to head it clear, and he flicks it on, and then it kind of banks off the post and goes mm-hmm. in, and somebody gets a touch to it before that. But it's poor marking, and it's a lack of any sort of awareness of what's going on. It's just everybody tried to head the ball clear. And that's why the United States drew up that play. Yeah. Because everybody rushes to the near post. One player flicks it on. Josie Altador is 
five yards unmarked inside the six yard box <laughs> yeah. and can knock it home. I think they'll definitely do, if not that play, then some design pieces, on set pieces. And you've got to, because you'll have so many, you've got to imagine against St. Vincent, you're going to have a lot of corner kicks. Yep. And probably a lot of free kicks because you'll get taken down as also, you're going yeah. down the wings, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. All right, one more guy who could play defensive midfield because it's his actual natural position mm-hmm. is Kelly Acosta. Yep. Is there any chance Kellen Acosta starts instead of Kyle Beckerman in the holding midfield role against St. Vincent? Again, there's a chance that anybody starts, baby. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. He's listed as a defender, He's right? He's listed because as a defender. we persist with this experiment of Kellen Acosta as fullback, which I have never, ever been convinced by. Mm-hmm. Not at senior team level, and not at under-20 level, and not at under-23 level. Well, I think it's a rule for the United States under Klinsman that you have to have three players that everybody wants to see played in a different position, right? Right. And he's met that quota because it's Fabian Johnson will probably be left back. Kellen Acosta might deputize at left back, but everybody wants him as a defensive midfielder. And Jeff Cameron, everybody wants to see play defensive midfield, <laughs> will probably start at center back. So who will play in the back for the United States? I'll sure. give you an easy one for a starter. Um, DeAndre Yedlin is probably going to start at right back. Yep. And maybe has something to prove, given that that first goal that St. Vincent scored, it was Oleks Anderson. It's, he just kind of cuts past DeAndre Yedlin, who's standing off a little bit hesitantly, and then Anderson shoots and scores. Yedlin does get forward and assist on the equalizer, yeah. but it's still Yedlin sort of doing some Yedlin things that he, make us scratch done our heads. many more Yedlin things since. I don't think he's even thinking about November 2015. Well, he should be. <laughs> but I think you're right. It's going to be Yedlin at right back. Uh, left back, I would say, is going to be Fabian Johnson. Because that's the Copa America lineup, right? right. So that's mm-hmm. probably what we're going to go with. And then... Between your center It was going to be John Brooks. It was definitely going to be John Brooks starting. Mm -hmm. He's out with a bad back. He's gone back to Hertha Berlin. So that leaves. Do you feel like Hertha Berlin said to him, like, oh, man, it's a shame you hurt your back, huh? And he's like, uh, yes, it is. It sure is. Holding a big mallet. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Looney Tunes style. Uh, That leaves Steve Birnbaum. That yeah. leaves Omar Gonzalez recalled. And yeah. then that leaves the two guys who will start, which is uh, Jeff Cameron and Matt Beasler. Why? So I understand Jeff Cameron because mm-hmm. he was the starting center back alongside John Brooks, right? So like from the Copa. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Jeff Cameron probably almost definitely starts this game. Why are you so confident that it's Matt Beasler? I'm confident because I think I would, I, I think I would like to see Omar Gonzalez start because I think he's earned it. He's gone abroad. He's done well. He, I think he des- like, deserves this call-up, but mm-hmm. I feel like Klinsman might be of the mindset of, like, that's enough. Like, you got this call-up. It shows you're still on my radar, and I feel like that's maybe where he's approaching it. Again, that means he's probably going to start at center back. So that's why I don't think Omar Gonzalez would be there even if I'd like for him to be. I think for Steve Birnbaum, he's more of, like, the kind of utility player, the kind of Swiss Army knife, that if they need a right back to fill in, he can do that. If they need a capable center back to fill in either way, if they need a big player to see out the win, that's where he goes. Yeah. But I think for the consistency, for the la- fact that they've played together, for the fact that I think Klinsman trusts them both a lot, that's why I see Cameron and Beasler together. The one argument I would have for definitely Cameron starting, but alongside not Matt Beasler, is that Omar Gonzalez and Steve Birnbaum are both crazy tall mm-hmm. and really effective mm-hmm. on set pieces. Right. So I see Steve Birnbaum and Omar Gonzalez as... Um, essentially they're in there as centre backs but they're selected kind of for their threat when they go forward mm-hmm. uh, for corner kicks and free kicks they're right. essentially in there as attacking targets right. I mean Jeff spelled J-E-F-F Cameron scored <laughs> against St. Vincent that on ESPN <laughs> right mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. They'll get, being sports will get that right worth noting that in the games that I have seen, in the highlights I have seen of the Vinnies, uh, they did not look like particular aerial threats. Mm-hmm. So that isn't a thing where it's like, yeah, but if we give them a set piece, they have these two huge guys who always win the headers. Mm-hmm. It seems like even then the United States will be okay defensively. No, I'm so then the... it becomes about attacking. Yeah, yeah so you, I'm just saying as, as a caveat that it's not like, oh, there's this huge guy that you need to pay attention to coming right. in for the Vinnies. It's more like, yeah, they're quick and pacey, and a few of them are very clever. All right, but don't be surprised if Steve Birnbaum starts and Steve Birnbaum scores from a corner kick there for we the go. United States. Mm-hmm. All right, that leaves just one position. Yep. It's the man who wears gloves. We think it's going to be Brad Guzan. Yep. And it's not just because he started um, in the Copa America. It's because we read a very, very clever article mm. By Rob Uzri yeah. at starsandstripesfc.com. Yeah, well done, Rob, who points out that Josie Altador has been named the captain for this game. But usually that would fall to Tim Howard if Tim Howard were going to play because he is the veteran, he is the mm-hmm. former captain. So it seems like if it's going to be Josie, then it's not going to be Tim Howard in goal, which means it probably will be Brad Kuzan. 
And thus, it will be Ethan Horvath. <laughs> <laughs> it will be Brad Gazan. Yeah, I think so. All right. So that, that's our starting lineup. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a 4 4 2. It's going to be Guzan in goal. It's going to be Yedlin and Johnson as your full backs. It's going to be Jeff Cameron as your centre back. And then Taylor says Beasler. I say Birnbaum okay. for the other centre back. Um, centre midfield, we both seem to agree that it's Beckerman and Bedoya, with an outside chance of it being Cleshton, but probably Beckerman and Bedoya. Wide guys, we think Zuzi's going to start. Um, then either Nagby or Pulisic. If you had to choose one, Nagby or Pulisic, who would you choose? I think Pulisic. I think. Interesting. I think. All right. And then, to say. and then we say Josie Altador and Bobby Wood up top mm-hmm. with maybe a late run out for uh, Jordan Morris. I've changed my mind. I want Nagby because I think against an opponent like St. Vincent, I, you, we've both played in those games where it, it starts really tough and it like looks like it's going to be tight and everyone's playing really hard. Then you put in one goal, then you put in two, then you put in three. You kind of know you're going to win, and then it starts coasting, and then it's a lot of people trying to do step overs and do fancy stuff. Pulisic, only in the sense that like he doesn't really do that, but I feel like he is the type of player, he has that skill level, that he might try to do a couple step overs. And I'd mm-hmm. rather United States focus on like retaining possession and playing smart passes, and Nagby is that player who's just going to be that glue that it's going to pass, 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 quick passes, smart passes, maintaining possession. So I think Nagby might get the edge. I agree. I think Nagby influences the shape and tempo of the game from the start, mm-hmm. and he's more important for that reason, to start the game. Yep. Whereas Pulisic, coming off the bench for 30 minutes yep. against a tired St. Vincent, it'll, he'll be the last Brew thing they want to see. Tall. Yeah. So I think that's the ideal usage of them, mm-hmm. except yep. for starting both of them. Yep. <laughs> oh, I was going to add, the only... I w- if this game were being played a week ago, I might agree with you more about Birnbaum starting because the window would still be open and he has been linked with a move away for quite some time. I mm-hmm. don't think that's happened. Last I checked the, the transfer list. Mm-hmm. So, But maybe if it were a week ago, Jurgen Klinsmann kind of puts him in the shop window a little bit more. That it's right. like, a U.S. international, come and get him. <laughs> but in this situation, I'm sticking with uh, Cameron and Beasler. So once again, the game is 3.30 Eastern kickoff mm-hmm. on Friday. It is televised on B in sports Spart. and your podcast review will come from the total soccer show um maybe an hour or so after the game we'll maybe have two a, hours or so we'll have a review show out 90 minutes after the game <laughs> okay <laughs> I, it'll be out 90 minutes after the game yeah that ain't gonna happen it'll be ready when it's ready <laughs> okay there we go <laughs> <laughs> same day though friday night we'll sure. have a review of uh, u.s versus saint vincent mm-hmm. um later in today's show we're going to talk slovakia england but first, we have a sponsor today, Taylor. It is Roughneck Scarves. Um, Roughneck Scarves are the official scarf provider for US soccer, MLS, NCAA, and USL. Roughneck Scarves are committed to providing passionate soccer fans with outstanding customer service, professional design, and the highest quality soccer scarves in the world. Oh, they're pretty. They're real, real pretty. <laughs> Roughneck Scarves are sponsoring this segment where we quiz each other on US-based supporters Mm -hmm. groups. So I think last time you were quizzing me, it was uh, Portland trivia, right? Mm -hmm. And I I believe it was was an offer for me. I went over (laughs) five. I think you got two of five uh, for the New York Red Bulls. Mm -hmm. And then I forget how you did it for the American Outlaws. But I'm pretty sure you did okay. I got five out of five. I don't think that's what happened. You can go back and listen (laughs) and find out. Today, Taylor, I will be quizzing you on the Sacramento Republic FC supporters group. Tower Bridge Battalion. Ooh, all right. TBB. I like it. So that's USL franchise, Western Conference USL yes. franchise, because we were talking about this earlier while we were doing the Richmond Kickers Charleston Battery commentary, uh-huh. is that it's weird that the Kickers have now qualified for the playoffs, we'll go through the playoffs, and then we'll play a team from the Western Conference that I don't believe they've played the entire season. Right. Which is a weird thing for yep. professional sports and playoffs. And do you know which train goes through Sacramento Republic FC? The F train. The Tommy Thompson hype train. All aboard. Tommy F. Woo, Thompson. Woo. You forgot his middle initial. That's <laughs> that right. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. So Tommy Thompson, one of my favorite players because he's, he's that like American maverick, right? Um, on the San Jose MLS roster, loaned out to their affiliate mm-hmm. Sacramento Republic FC. Tommy time. It's, it's Tommy time. It's flicks over your head and tricks. There will be a Tommy Thompson question in this quiz. Yeah, that checks out. <laughs> All right. First up, the Tower Bridge Battalion. When were they founded? When was this supporters group founded? Hmm. <laughs> when was uh, Sacramento Republic founded? I can't tell you that. All right. Then I'm going old school. 1849. <laughs> Why not coincide with a gold rush? Not really, no. Uh, I'm going to say 1999. 
Terrorbridge Battalion was founded in 2012. Okay, or a yes. little bit more recently. <laughs> All right, next up, um, the TBB stands behind one of the goals at Bunnyfield, obviously. Mm-hmm. It's where Supporters Group stands. But which goal do they stand behind, north or south? Okay, so my gut says south. But I feel like Tower Bridge has a northern connotation. So I'm saying north. That is correct. <laughs> the Tower Bridge Battalion stand behind the north goal at Bonnyfield. Yep. All right. The Tower Bridge Battalion does its march to the match from Husong's Cantina to the stadium. Mm-hmm. How many minutes before kickoff does the march to the match begin? Hmm. So I'm going to assume, as it was with uh, Empire, that it was the closest bar to the stadium. So I'm going to say... 30 minutes before kickoff. Nice try. Match the match begins 45 minutes mm. before Oh, they're, they're well prepared. <laughs> See, a part of this is that that makes way more sense than I would have said 45 yeah. minutes to an hour. But I'm used to our Red Army, who do it about a minute yeah. before kickoff. You also kind of cut things close, right, timing-wise? No. Nah, so you, you I like le- to think that I don't, but sure. You would leave 30 minutes before kickoff. Tower Bridge Battalion leaves 45 before kickoff. That doesn't sound like me. <laughs> okay, if you wanted to join the Tower Bridge Battalion... Mm-hmm. How much would it cost you for an annual membership in American dollars? This is a risky question. This is a risky question. I'm going to say it's worth millions, but it costs annually $50. $15. Woo! Wow. All right. And bear in mind, you're still going to buy your tickets on top of that. Oh, okay, okay. So it's 15 just to be a member. Gotcha. Okay, so that's the Tarabridge Battalion. When the Tarabridge Battalion are cheering on Mm -hmm. Sacramento Republic FC, they are watching Tommy Thompson in action Mm -hmm. Tommy Thompson has finally been producing this season getting goals getting assists how many goals and assists does Tommy Thompson have combined I'll give you a clue it is the same number for both so what is that number I'm going to say 18 he has 18 goals and 18 assists oh no sorry 18 total 18 total add them together yeah it's three goals and three assists. Okay, he's so not, not so much. He's not quite as productive as you wish he was, but it's still the best he's ever done. That was based on Romario Williams, who we saw play earlier tonight, <laughs> who had 11 goals, and I was like, Tommy Thompson, if he's tearing it up, maybe yeah. he's just behind. But you remember Tommy Thompson was like famously like wonderful to watch, but it never resulted in any actual like points the in terms of goals and assists. The word comes to mind, yeah. Yeah, but finally he's getting it done. There we go. Yeah. All right. Tommy Thompson. Well done, Tommy Time. Tommy Train, Tommy Gun. So I hope everyone's now better informed about the Tower Bridge Battalion, mm-hmm. supporters group for Sacramento Republic FC. Thank you to Roughneck Scarves for sponsoring this segment. Right, and if our listeners want to thank Roughneck Scarves as well or just pick up a scarf on their own, they can. Uh, they can use the promo code Total Soccer Show, all one word, all uppercase, to get 20% off any scarf in the shop. That's all-inclusive pricing, and Roughneck's simple and honest pricing means no hidden fees, no unexpected shipping charges, and no surprises. So that's Roughneck Scarves, and how do we spell that, Tyler? R-U-F-F-N-E-C-K. And I think no surprises unless you order the Tommy Thompson scarf, which I've just decided <laughs> should exist, in which case it sometimes shows up and sometimes doesn't. Well, if you wanted the, the uh, Tommy Thompson scarf to exist, you mm-hmm. can create a custom scarf at roughneckscarves.com, mm-hmm. and you could order it. There are many options as well. It would well. say Tommy Time in big letters, and you could you wave need, it as long as you want. Do you need a hot weather scarf? A cold weather scarf. They've got you covered with both. Is that right? Mm-hmm. What's a cold weather scarf? No, what's a hot weather scarf? I think it's, it's like, like the lighter fabric that basically yes. is more breathable, or like I think they even have the silk one, so it's right. like, you know, so you, you want to show your support yeah. without sweating to death. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks again to Roughneck Scarves. We'll put a link in the show notes if you want to click on through and take a look at all the scarves that they have to offer. All right, Taylor, Mm -hmm. let's talk England. Let's do it. It's Sam Allardyce's debut as England manager. It is the start of World Cup qualifying in Europe. Mm -hmm. It is England away to Slovakia on Sunday. It is a noon Eastern kickoff, and you can find it on ESPN Deportes or ESPN3. Is that what they still call it? No, it's Watch ESPN now, isn't it? I think it is, or ESPN 360. (laughs) <laughs> That's Come the original yeah. 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 So, you, yeah, you can find this game on ESPN. Mm-hmm. F- first up, <laughs> England struggled against Slovakia nice, yeah. at the Euros. Mm-hmm. I just, I had a, I was having um, a sense memory of watching England fail to score against Slovakia mm-hmm. in the final group stage of Euro 2016. Yep. So, there couldn't be a better contrast of what went wrong for Roy Hodgson's mm-hmm. England versus what. Sam Allardyce hopes to get right. I take that back. They could be playing Iceland. Yep. <laughs> but apart from that, there couldn't be a better contrast. <laughs> so I know I have a lot of thoughts about England because I spend a lot of time thinking about England. But I'm interested in your take, Taylor. How do you see this game? 
Uh, well, the game as a whole or England as a whole right now? I mean, both. Like, how, what are your thoughts on England okay. under Sam Allardyce heading mm. into this game? Because well, I'm excited about the new era, uh -huh. and I feel like it's always me talking about being excited about Allardyce, and I'm not sure if you're there with me or not. I'm not, actually, to be honest. I mean, and that's because I think... because you're me, not from Dudley? Yeah, that's a distinct possibility. <laughs> oh, you remember where he's from, do you? Oh, you forget <laughs> Ashley Williams, I see. Um, I think it's also because... I I watch the Premier League. I watch English soccer, but I think it's easy to overlook like managers that tend to manage mid table clubs that yeah. finish mid table. That you can make the argument like the most high profile job he got outside of England was that Newcastle job mm -hmm. after what he did at Bolton mm -hmm. and pretty much failed at Newcastle and had to find new employment. Well, right? I would say they failed by firing him and they did it way too early. It is and Newcastle. Then things went wrong. So yeah. you know, grain of salt. There. <laughs> yeah, but it it just it's you sort of miss the ins and outs and all that goes into. Sam being Sam and mm -hmm. the big Sam mentality and how charismatic is, he is. And you just sort of tend to, I think, as an outsider, look at his results and the way his teams tend to play because he's the manager that doesn't get relegated. So he's the one that you bring in when you're in relegation trouble. So he's the one who finishes 17th and 18th, or 17th, not 18th. And so it takes away, I think, some of that like excitement because he seems like more of a manager who is, eh, he'll get the job done, but it's not going to be exciting and it's going to be kind of desperation. That's not what I'm expecting, though. Okay. I'm expecting England to go to Slovakia mm -hmm. and win and sort of inaugurate this Sam Allardyce regime um, in style. Why? Because I like the Sam Allardyce pragmatism. Mm -hmm. And I see the roster he selected. We already talked about this on our sort of roster show. Um, I'm expecting the starting 11 that he selects to be full of pragmatic choices where mm -hmm. he's made hard choices and not included. For example, it didn't include Jack Wilshere, didn't include Ross Barkley in his squad for pragmatic reasons. Mm -hmm. I'm expecting his starting 11 to be the same thing. Okay. All right. So that makes sense. So then do you see, going off of what we talked about with that Slovakia game, and I would say that it's a weird thing where, again, it's a really good thing to be playing Slovakia at this point because it is sort of, you can immediately go out, if you beat them 2-0 away, it shows this is a different team with different expectations, mm -hmm. different mission. Yep. But if you go there and it's another turgid 0-0 draw or you lose 1-0, then it's sort of like, wow, we've, we're the same or we've regressed. Yeah. So it can go either way for him. And I think that's probably why he canceled the friendly. A lot of teams are playing a friendly on Friday, then See, their qualifier on Sunday. This is a thing I love. Yeah, mm -hmm. he could have had a friendly mm -hmm. to inaugurate his regime. He cancelled it and instead said, no, let's have a week of practice so we can get ready for Slovakia and mm -hmm. not have the distraction of a meaningless friendly. Right. I love it. See, but you say meaningless, though. But you've called in 23 players still. So that's still 23 players. You can play 11. You can sub in three. So then you've got, what, nine players who aren't going to be involved? Goalkeepers, that makes sense. It drops to seven. But still... Like when you have that friendly, you can try different things. You can bring in different players. You can use players that you wouldn't otherwise use. There's a little bit less pressure, and it allows you to gel a little bit more. But I kind of like just the focus of, okay, we're playing against Slovakia. Here are the things we're going to do against mm -hmm. Slovakia. Let's have an entire week of practicing them so we can go out and execute against Slovakia. And I understand that maybe I'm just getting overexcited about this, this change because for years and years and years now, England has been about... Let's get games at Wembley. Let's sell it out. Mm -hmm. Let's get as much money as we can. Let's have as many showpiece events as we can. Mm -hmm. and instead, now we have a coach that's saying, no, the important thing is that we go away to Slovakia and win. I'm just going to focus on that. Okay, that's fair. You're right. Because I have to... Really... What, what that decision represents is more exciting to me, you know? Well, yeah, but I also think about what that friendly represents. And you're right. It is going to be... I forget who it was going to be against, but it probably I think wouldn't it be. Think it was Croatia? Yeah. So, I mean, Croatia are, are excellent, don't get me wrong, but they're not – it's not some like, crazy exciting team that everyone's going to want to like pay for. Like, yeah, you'll get Luka Modric, Ivan Rakitic, but it's not Spain, Brazil, Argentina. So it's not going to be that exciting of a friendly to begin with, and then it's still going to be a friendly. And so even if it's like, oh, 1-0 to England, great, but let's see how you do in a competitive game. So – because it's mm -hmm. either great, but let's see what happens – on Sunday, or you lose, and it's like, wow, we're off to a flying start. And it's three days you don't get to prepare for Slovakia because mm -hmm. you have one day preparing for the friendly, one day playing the friendly, one day recovering from mm -hmm. the friendly, right? That's right. three days you don't get back. And maybe also, and, and I'll, I'll take it another level, I think you're talking me into this now, because you could also make the argument that him sort of saying, like, no, we need extra time to prepare for Slovakia is not the mentality that a lot of English managers would have. Mm -hmm. I feel like England managers tend to treat Slovakia like, say, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, when mm -hmm. Slovakia are a team that went to the Euros and competed and did really well and have a lot of talent. Marek Hamšík, looking in your direction. So to not overlook them, to not be overly confident, but to say, like, no, we need extra practice, we need to be really prepared, 
it's a pragmatic approach. Here's the thing. Roy Hodgson rested a lot of players for that game against Slovakia, mm-hmm. and then they tied 0-0 and finished second in the group behind Wales. That's worth remembering. If we yep. hadn't done that, we wouldn't have played Iceland in that round of 16 game. Okay, so we've said pragmatic, we've said practical. You're excited. I'm getting more excited about this England <laughs> game. What, what are some other reasons? Can you give like two or three reasons why people should be excited to watch this England game as opposed to ex- expecting another 0-0 draw? Well, I think... so. I don't want to harp on this pragmatic thing, but I Mm. think the idea of picking a pragmatic team leads to a team that is functional and works, so then you get to see England score goals. Okay, so what do you think would be a pragmatic, practical, functional team? So I think it will be Harry Kane as a striker, Harry Kane not taking corner kicks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Harry Kane with Wayne Rooney behind him. Wayne Rooney not playing central midfield, playing as a second striker. Did you see that article or that story this week? Wayne Rooney sort of came public about the corners? I did. That He just took over taking them. Yeah, Um, he was like, this is stupid. Uh This is like one of the best headers in the game in the English Premier League. Why is he taking corners? Mm -hmm. And that happened against Wales, right? He took Mm -hmm. over and England won that game, I believe. Yeah, I find it not a coincidence that it's the same week that he gets named captain (laughs) that he comes out and is like, yeah, I took took the lead and also I'm not (laughs) retiring yet. And so I also, I watched some of the um, the FA video that mm-hmm. they posted and every practice highlight that I saw, and I know this isn't gospel and you can't take it too seriously, Harry Kane and Wayne Rooney were on the same team. Yep. Kane further forward, Rooney underneath him, and Theo Walcott to their right. So and then Vardy and Sturridge were off to the side looking sad. I mean, I didn't see that, but that you could fill that in mentally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I'm looking for is um, a, a Sam Allardyce team to start with that Kane and Rooney thing, and not trying to force then Vardy and Sturridge mm-hmm. in around them to have, say, the thing I would like to see is Walcott on the right, Raheem Sterling on the left. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing I just said with Bobby Wood, right? It's like you're just shoehorning Jamie Vardy in on the right because mm-hmm. Jamie Vardy can play on the right, question mark, but yeah. we want to get him in there because he scores goals. It's the FIFA approach, I feel like, to management, which is like, oh, here's a rated 87 player. I better get him in my lineup. I'll put him on the right wing. And yeah, and then he's like rated 78. But yeah, still but you good. don't really pay attention to that because you think he's still an 87. <laughs> and then you haven't really adjusted to the new FIFA rules that, that they change that type of thing and is then I get ev- in trouble. Yeah. Is that how people do it? Me, maybe. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, if that's the front four we see, I'm super excited. All right. And then I think behind that, I'd like to see um, Eric Dyer doing that holding midfield role again. Very curious what name you're about to say here. This is the, this is the uh-huh. tricky one, right? It's either Jordan Henderson or Deli Ali, or maybe, if we're going to go crazy, it's Drinkwater. Mm-hmm. I think it's Deli Ali. I think it's Deli Ali as well. Okay. And I think it might be Deli Ali followed by a Drinkwater, if I were to, to gamble on that one. Just because I think, again, if you're going to go practical, Drinkwater is the one who can win the ball back in midfield, put uh, the midfield under pressure for Slovakia. But also, as we saw this weekend, he can play that long ball. He can mm-hmm. hit those smart through balls and find the feet of Wayne Rooney and the head of Harry Kane. Maybe the cool thing to do would be to have Harry Kane start, Deli Ali start, and mm. then the switch you make later in the game is to bring in... Drinkwater and Vardy. Drinkwater and Vardy and have <laughs> that connection. Yep. Right? And then it's Tottenham versus Leicester. Let's see who plays better. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> and then in the back, it's got to be... For me, it's got to be John Stones mm-hmm. starting. Yep. Right? It's got to be John Stones starting, I think, alongside Chris Smalling. Mm-hmm. Which is love risky. Chris, I love Chris Smalling. As do I, but it's risky because he hasn't started a game for Man United this season. He came on as a late substitute once they were beating Hull. Is this an injury thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's still oh. recovering from injury. I think that said, he is back to full fitness, so I won't be surprised if he starts alongside Stones. Or maybe Gary Cahill then. Mm-hmm. Yep, could be. Yeah, maybe Cahill Stones is the way to yep. go. All right, and then outside of that, I think the return of Luke Shaw is a big thing that um, Roy Hodgson was robbed of. Sam Allardyce gets to uh, gets to enjoy the return yeah, I think of Luke Shaw. Roy Hodgson and Louis Van Hall both mourning the leg break yeah. of Luke Shaw. Yeah, it's rough. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think Kyle Walker, I think was ill. Um, that's why he came out of one of the Tottenham game. I think he's okay now. I think Kyle Walker's going to start at right back. Mm-hmm. And then in goal, it's got to be Joe Hart, Torino's own Joe Hart. I think I might not have agreed with you a couple, maybe even a week ago. But now that he's gotten his move, he's chosen to challenge himself by moving to Italy to play for a different team as opposed to playing for like a middling Premier League club and see uh-huh. what happens. I think maybe that earns him some respect. It also means that he's probably a little bit more calm and confident and steady going into this camp than he would be if he was sort of new Pep Guardiola was out, out, like outside right now being like, who wants to play goalkeeper for me? Can you pass the ball? Then you'll be fine. Yeah. Bellissimo. Yeah, see. Si. Maybe we'll see some uh, Italian hand gestures from Joe Hart in this game already. I have to say, he has a certain reputation, we'll put it that way, uh, for mental acuity. And <laughs> some of the photos of him like holding up Italian stuff really did have that. Was it Ian Rush? 
about that it's like playing in a different uh, yeah, country. Yeah, Italy's like a foreign country. It felt a little bit like that, where he was sort of like, wait, why is this shirt in a different language? And it just did, it seemed a little bit befuddled, but that could also be jet lag and sort of all of a sudden playing for a Serie A team. And he's had a whirlwind week. Yeah, a little right? bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, there's no guarantee that he starts, but there probably is Joe, Joe Hart starts in goal. I think so, yeah. And then we've got to look at, um, we've got to look at Slovakia. Mm-hmm. You, got, you mentioned Her- Marek Hamšík earlier. That's the guy to watch. He's mm-hmm. a guy you can't take your eyes off because of that crazy faux hook haircut. But he's also... He was in my the, Viking team. He's also the attacking threat, especially yep. if Slovakia hits England on the counter. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's, he's the creative fulcrum. He's the free kick taker. He's the crafty one who comes up with set pieces. That said, uh, that brilliant set piece, the short corner, to, and yes, then he rocks it him, drawn out and put into play by Vladimir Weiss. Not on this roster. you pointed out is not on this roster. And I'm kind of happy that uh, Miro Sto, not Mm -hmm. on this roster. I think you should be as well. Because I I bad-mouthed him throughout Euro 2016. You sure did. And I didn't want Karma to come back and bite me in the form of a Sto goal. Again, an electrifying player at times. (laughs) (laughs) But not on this roster. A player who is in this roster, who will be familiar to most uh, fans of the Premier League, is Martin Skirtle. No longer of the Premier League. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe, of uh, Fenerbahce in Turkey. So it would be a Skirtle, a Duica, um, probably the centre-back partnership. Two big, muscly guys, two veterans. Um, A lot of grabbing on corners Mm -hmm. is what I'm expecting from Skirtle. Maybe England wins a penalty kick for Skirtle, wrapping, wrapping his arms around Harry Kane. Those new rules about holding in the box do not help Martin Skirtle. They sure don't. It's all, they almost should, almost should be called the Skirtle rule. Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. I'm also sort of just realizing now how much of a disservice I've done to this show by not being caught up on Game of Thrones until this point. Because <laughs> everybody goes with Skeletor with Martin Skirtle. And I uh-huh. think that's overly simplistic. Because I think we should go should with... get a bit more meat on his bones. Who's, the, who's the, the wildling? I know that's a derogatory term. I apologize. Who's also a cannibal? The, the big giant one with a shaved head and the battle axe who uh, I think he fights... I think he fights the the White Walkers, but regardless, that that's who Martin Skirtle is. He's got like the face tattoo scratches and everything like that. Oh yes, I can't mm-hmm. remember his name. Can't remember his name either. I'm sure it's one word, but multiple that's people frantically tweeting it at us right now, just furiously screaming into their uh, into their iPhones. Yeah, thank you to everybody who just <laughs> tweeted the yeah. name of that character. But you know us. what I mean? Like, kind of looks like he might eat you if it uh-huh. gave, gave him a competitive advantage. Probably that would be, that would be a penalty kick, right? Probably, maybe. I'm not sure. Shaved head, tall, skinny, but got meat on the bones, and would probably kill you if it meant that he could get an advantage. <laughs> I'm saying, yeah, that's a little more apt. So that's a, a matchup to look forward to, mm-hmm. Skirtle versus Harry Kane and uh, Derutza as well. Um, also, a guy that really caught my eye for Slovakia, um, Robert Mack. Um, he's recently joined Zenit. Mm-hmm. He's a winger, dangerous guy going down the right wing. So Luke Shaw versus Robert Mack, that's a, that's a matchup to watch. Mm-hmm. So with all of that said... Are you feeling confident in this game? I knowing really that, am. Knowing that it's probably one of the two hardest fixtures you're going to have, England did get a relatively weak group. I'd say it's this one and away to Scotland are the two pretty tough ones. Yeah, and even that's more emotional than actual. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right? <laughs> um, I am feeling confident, but, I mean, if, if you're a long-term listener to the show, you'll know I was feeling confident in 2010, mm-hmm. in 2012, in 2014, in 2016. Well, I have a reason why you should be confident, and it's – one of my sort of conspiracy theories, which is a lot of times the sites that tend to put out uh, match previews well in advance of the game are betting sites because they want to encourage betting as far back as they can. Uh And I read a few different betting site previews, and all of them were so negative about England, about how you know Sam Allardyce is so desperate he's trying to recruit Steven and Zanzi to play for England, and he can't get Mike. You know he doesn't know what he's going to do. He's not sure what he's going to do. How are they going to approach this game? Why should this make me optimistic? Because I think that betting sites, shockingly, have a vested interest in getting people to <laughs> gamble a certain way. Yeah. So all of them that I saw, I mean, there was a few that was like back a cheeky cane goal, but a lot of them were like back a nil nil draw, back an England loss. And it just seems like they're trying to push the action in one direction. <laughs> Are you saying bet insights give you bad advice about where, what to do with your money? Sometimes. Sometimes they might. I think always. Sometimes they might, yeah. <laughs> and so it just seems like they're all t- really trying to paint this negative, bad, desperate picture of England when I don't think that's the case. Mm-hmm. And so to me, that means that maybe there's an expectation amongst the professionals that you might see that kind of new manager bounce, that surge, and uh, maybe in a way win. For England. I agree. I, the reason I'm excited, I expect to see a more focused, more pragmatic, I know it's the word I keep using, mm-hmm. more professional and more sort of respectful of your opposition, England. Okay. Away to Slovakia at noon Eastern on Sunday. 
Two final things, then. Number one... <laughs> There's no such thing as two final things, number one. Two mostly final things. <laughs> number one, I'm annoyed with myself because the other thing I should have drawn a comparison with with Martin Skirtle is that he 100% has a battle axe somewhere in his locker room. Uh, yeah. So that fits. Number two, you can only answer in, like, one-word answers to this. Okay. okay. Sam ready. Allardyce, on the touchline. Formal attire or soccer attire? Formal. Okay. Formal for this game. Now we've got that. Uh, no, he's no more. About no more beating because the you know what I'm going to go with next. So he's wearing formal. Tie. Or no tie. It's a tough one, right? No tie. I say no tie as well. Because he's going to go formal to, you know, he's going to have cameras on him. Sam Allardyce does not like a tie. Sam Allardyce likes a loosely buttoned collar. Right. And I think he's going to go comfort, but formal yeah. for this first game. I think so. All right, so that's another one to watch. Because I'm very curious if he's wearing a tie. <laughs> yeah, suit, no tie. That's what I'm expecting. It reminds me of when Dwight Shute ha- Shrute has to wear long sleeve shirts. Uh, when he has a new boss, when when Stringer Bell becomes his boss, and he just says, like, I feel like I'm in a straight jacket. Like, I can just see Sam Allardyce <laughs> frantically clutching at his tie if he's forced to wear one by the FA. <laughs> All right, so that game again is Sunday at noon. We'll have a review of that for you um, on the Monday Total Soccer Show. Sounds like a plan. But one final segment before we hit the road, Mr. Grove. We've got some scouting reports. Boy, do we do. have some scouting reports. And it's a lot of guys on the move because the transfer window has now closed. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, Total Soccer Show Scouting Network members on the move. Mm-hmm. So, what do we got up first, Mr. Grove? First up, um, Guy Yedwab lets us know that Serge Gnabry, uh, the German um, who was playing for Arsenal, has been on the move. Um, Guy lets us know that Gnabry finalized a permanent move from Arsenal, a permanent move from Arsenal to Werder Bremen. Guy says, I was worried that Bremen only wanted a short-term loan to cover injuries. Um, they started the season with uh, Pizarro, Johansson, or Cruz as their only goal-scoring options. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the fact that they've signed a long-term deal means they think he'll be a key piece moving forward. It also means you get to see him and Aaron Johansson holding hands up top. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll be Johansson alone up top, mm-hmm. as it was against Bayern. But at least he'll have... Um, some creative help from Gnabry. Yes, sir. What else we got, Tyler? Well, first, I want to say, Mr. Yedwab, thank you for that report. And I made Daryl go first. I tricked him into doing it so that I could ask this question. Curious if it's Guy or Guy, as I was responding to this email earlier. So I want to know that in his next scouting report as well. It's Mr. Yedwab to you. Uh, well, that's how I addressed him. Uh, next report comes from Matt Shea, or Mr. Shea, scouting Alessio uh, Romagnoli. I'm hoping I pronounced that one. Alessio was called up to the Italian national team and could earn his first cap this weekend. He also had a yellow card for handballing the ball out of the net in Milan's 4-2 loss to Napoli. <laughs> it wasn't as cool as the Suarez versus Ghana, though, says Matt. <laughs> Scouting report from Will Robeson about young American Weston McKenney. Big news. Big news. Weston McKenney has signed with FC Schalke. He'll play for their U19s, where he'll join fellow American youth teamer Haji Right. Mm-hmm. And I looked into Weston McKenney's birthday. He turned 18 on August 28. Eight. Mm. confirming what we know about mm-hmm. you only being able to sign uh, for a German team, for a European team, once you turn 18, if you're an American. Um, Pulisic could only play early for Dortmund because he has that Croatian passport. Right. We had a question from uh, Benton Campbell about why the disparity between us saying that you Americans have to turn 18 before they sign for German teams uh, and Pulisic signing when he was younger, it's because he had the Croatian passport. All right. Well, premature happy birthday to Hanif Wright and uh, premature <laughs> congratulations on moving to Schalke to Hanif Wright. <laughs> Sound about right? But Weston McKenney mm-hmm. is there. Yep, and very exciting. Uh, Chris Bernhardt emails in regarding Tammy Abraham. The Chelsea youth teamer is now a senior player at Bristol City where he signed a season-long loan. Uh, he earned a poacher's goal and a skillful assist in a 3-1 win over Aston Villa. He has now scored four goals in five championship games. He's the new Patrick Bamford? I think he will not enjoy that title. But taller? <laughs> and maybe better? We shall find out. Brad Boldman is letting us know about Rolando Aranz. Mm-hmm. I believe Rolando Aranz was at Newcastle United. Still is. Which makes him a DeAndre Yedlin teammate. Ish. Brad lets us know that since Aranz signed his new five-year contract, that's a big commitment from Newcastle. Sure is. He's made two appearances in the 90th and 88 minutes. <laughs> he also injured his foot and will likely miss significant time for the third consecutive year. That started well. That's why I said ish when you said teammate of DeAndre Yedlin. Eventually he will be. Uh, Maybe more optimistic news coming out of England comes from Ben Tundera, scouting Mason Holgate. Uh, Another week, another start in the Premier League. Holgate played the full 98 right back in a 1-0 win over Stoke City on Saturday. 
Seems likely that uh, once everyone is fully fit, he will no longer be the starter for Everton. But since he has been for these three games, he has impressed, which means with his current form, he has uh, been named to the England U21 team for their 2017 Euro qualifiers against Norway. We have a report from Carl Gertz about Zach Clough. Carl, I believe I posted you a Total Sock Show t-shirt this very day. <laughs> you sure did. It is on the way. There was photographic evidence to prove it. Which I emailed him. <laughs> So Carl um, is scouting Zach Clough. Uh, he lets us know that Clough injured his hamstring in preseason, but recovered in time to be a second-half sub in Bolton's season opener. Um, Clough then started the next game against Fleetwood and was subbed out in the 33rd minute after re-aggravating his hamstring. Hamstrings are pesky. Yeah, so I think I started off by saying it's been a good week for the TSS Scouting Network. It's been an up-and-down week, is how we're going to put it. But we're going to finish strong. Uh, Joe uh, McKiernan scouting Gabriel Barbosa. Gabriel was officially announced as an interplayer on his 20th birthday. Hey. Yeah, no longer a teenager, now an Italian player. Uh, Juventus were heavily involved in the bidding process, but it came down to economic rights and the possibility of third-party ownership. Uh, regardless, Gabigol should get plenty of minutes under Frank De Boer this season. Lots more mm-hmm. TSS Scouting Network reports have been coming in. Sure have. Um, Jack Wilshire, not in the Scouting Network, Mm-mm. but has gone on a season-long loan from Arsenal to Bournemouth. Not great. It's Well, it's good news if you want to see more Jack Wilshire. Mm-hmm. It's bad news... If you're an Emerson Hyndman fan. If you're an Emerson Hyndman yep. fan, because it knocks uh, US midfielder Emerson Hyndman one notch down the pecking order to yeah, mix my where metaphors. Where he was already... I th- think seventh maybe the seventh choice central midfielder now might be eighth so yeah mm-hmm. richie garcia will not be pleased because emerson heidman is farther away further away than before from the bournemouth starting lineup yeah i feel like he's got january loan written all over him Urgh. yeah but we shall see and when we do i'm sure we'll get some scouting reports about it or a magnificent bournemouth central midfield of emerson heidman and jack wilshire sure that sure. could also be a thing yes <laughs> Thank you to everybody who sent us a scouting report. If you would like to join the TSS Scouting Network and support the Total Soccer Show, you can go to totalsockshow.com slash subscribe, select the level at which you would like to subscribe, and then we will send you a player to scout. Sounds like a plan, Mr. Grove. Thank you for being here with me late into the evening on uh, now, what, Thursday morning? It is Thursday morning there night, we are. and that's why this is the Thursday Total Soccer Show. Yep, yep, yep. The Friday show will be the review of the USA against St. Vincent and the Grenadines. You got it all in there. The Vinci Heat, the Vinnies, the Goodfellas, the Joe Pesci's. So we look forward to watching that game and reviewing that game. Um, until then, Taylor Rockwell, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Right back at you, buddy. Listeners, thank you for listening. We always enjoy spending time with you, and we'll talk to you again very soon.